we're going to continue in here in 32.123 with Michael Casey as the moderator of a talk on governance and regulation. And so Michael Casey is a professional writer, a professional speaker, um, you know, and I'll let him introduce the rest of the uh, panelists. Hi, everybody. Uh, change of gears. We had the brilliant Nehan Arula, who I work with at the DCI, uh, give us some, some, some really exciting tech. Um, so we've gone from the nerds to, to the lawyers, in a way. Um, we're here to talk about the uh, exciting world of regulation. Um, and I've got with me, yeah, I would say, pretty much of an all-star panel, Gary Gensler, who um, amongst a history of, of working in and out of Washington and Wall Street, uh, most recently uh, he was, uh, well, he had some other things. So the most, most prominently was the, the, the last chair of the CFTC in the Obama administration, right? Correct. CFTC, the, com the, Communities, uh, the Commodities Futures Traded Commission. Yeah, I was chair of that. But after that, my last thing was uh, Hillary's chief financial officer. Hillary's chief officer. financial, exactly, so yeah. Deeply but... into losing a campaign. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jerry Brito, many of you would know, uh, the director of, the, of Coin Center, uh, which is an advocacy group based in Washington. And Patrick Merck, who um, has been there from the, pretty much the beginning of it all, uh, Bitcoin Foundation for some time as general counsel and briefly as executive director, now at the, the Berkman Center at Harvard uh, and also a, a lawyer at Cooley. So um, some big names. I just want to just frame this and to, and, and to say why I'm excited to be here. Uh, I am based at MIT, so it's just nice to be on, on home turf. I've just been on a bit of a whistle stop book tour and uh, I've just published a book and, and it, during that period you kind of get fated as this, you know, as the star. People come up and congratulate you all the time and you, you get your ego stroked all the time. And um, so I was thinking about this panel because as much as we have a nice big crowd here, I understand this is the overflow room. So this is the second fiddle to, to everyone else. Um, and I've got, as I said, an all-star panel. So. I should perhaps be a little offended, right? My, my ego should be a little bit upset by this when the cryptographers in the other room are talking about, you know, directed as acyclic graphs and these sort of complicated things. When in reality, that's what makes this a wonderful event. That this is a place where you're not going to get necessarily the egos strutting up and down talking about, you know, who they know in Washington and who they don't, but that we're really focusing on what's being built here. So I want to make sure that we this conversation is framed around that very important work, that the stuff that's happening at this institution and others to, to build out this exciting new technology in the best way possible is enabled uh, in the safest, best way possible by the regulation. So let's just put that in context. Anyway, it's, I'm just thrilled to be here and to, to, to see you all come along. So I, I'd like each of you to just give us a bit of a framing of, of where things stand. Um, I'm actually going to go to Jerry first because, um, you know, you've been in this advocacy role for about four years now. Is it longer? Four? Five? Coin Center more before that. Right, exactly. But Coin Center is four years. So you've really seen, you know, you've been at the front lines dealing with regulators. Are they getting it? What's happened? Um, are we moving forwards, backwards? You know, in terms of how regulators understand and are responding to this technology, how have we evolved? So <clears throat> I think if you start with the premise that um, we have any number of laws and regulations that uh, implicate this technology and uses of this technology, and those laws will be applied. Um, if, you, if you sort of start there, um, you then what you want to hope for is that the folks who are in charge of interpreting the law and then applying it will understand the technology so they don't make mistakes, they don't, you know, they don't do anything out of ignorance. Um, and then that where they have calls to make, that they make calls that err on the side of innovation, right, of allowing um, innovators to do what they do. And with that metric in mind, I think it's been a very positive four years. Um, because just, just from the very beginning, um, I mean, there's some glaring uh, uh, um, sort of um, uh, examples of the opposite, right? So you have the bid license, for example, where it was just a, a disaster, the way that that was uh, approached. Um, but in general, it's very positive if you think about, you know, the way that the anti-money laundering laws have been interpreted. And, you know, initially, um, you could quibble with the process, but 
the result um, sort of was fair. And since they were first announced, it's been further um, refined. Um, if you think about the tax treatment, it's not the worst thing that could have happened. Um, so using that bar, I think it's been incredibly positive. I think, I think folks in DC, um, the fo as this technology begins to implicate their jurisdiction, right, so whether it's anti-money laundering was first, tax was second, right, um, then it was the CFPB, now it's the SEC. So as it implicates them, typically they really get up to speed quickly um, and, uh, and, and learn a lot. I think um, lately the ship has been shaking uh, a bit just because the velocity um, of, uh, uh, of, of what's happening in this space is just exploding and um, there's much more demand for information about this. And so lately, uh, I think we're start starting to see a lot of folks, especially in Congress, jump in who maybe have not taken the time to educate themselves. And so, and so I think we, we need to sort of address that. So lately, I, 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 you know, I, I detect um, uh, maybe some slowing down of that positivity, but in general, it's been positive. That's an interesting perspective. That once we sort of widen the awareness, you sort of have to once again start re-educating people, or no, newly educating those who weren't before because they're starting to participate. So Patrick, you know, you've also been on this journey for some time, um, and you know, you, you've dealt with it both from something of an advocacy role, you know, you've always been there as a, as a sounding board for regulators, but you've also been in the private practice world of, of, of law. Um, you know, how has that, how's that, that evolved uh, in terms of, you know, the way that lawyers themselves have come to it um, and, and, and what role can the profession play in, in trying to sort of move this into a safe space? Yeah, that's right. And thanks, Mike. And, um I know that we're not supposed to stroke egos here, but I'll stroke Jerry's ego a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, you, you do wonder where we would be as a community if, if groups like Coin Center weren't there uh, educating people and making sure that those lawmakers had the right information in their hand, or at least had access to it. How they act on it is anybody's guess, but um, so, so kudos to you, you. and your team you. um, for doing great work, and I think that's part of the reason we've had a positive outcome. Um, and what I've seen over the years is, is, you know, as this has grown, right, there was from the very beginning when there was a very small number of people involved and, geez, I was the Bitcoin lawyer, which is scary, right? That's a scary thought. Um, to a place now where we have legal practices at major law firms all over the world. We have advocacy groups in D.C. and abroad. We have people who are out there who are energized and who are educated on the subject. And to me, that's, that's been the biggest shift, right, that I've seen over time. Um, aside from the technology and, and the platforms that are being built, the number of really intelligent, smart, energized people who have entered the space, who have stayed in the space, and who are pushing the boundaries and growing the community, I mean, it's, it's impressive. It's impressive. And I think more than any of the technologies that we'll talk about here, Today, I think that's the thing that is, gives me the most hope that this is going to continue to be positive and have a sustained push out into the future. Um, as far as the role of the legal profession in all of this, um, you know, I have a, my perspective is maybe a little bit different than your traditional lawyer. Um, I've been a founder, I've been an early employee, I've been an advisor, investor, a lawyer, uh, and an academic in this space, um, and in digital currency and fintech for about a decade now. Um, and uh, so when I see people who want to build things, right, I want to see those things built. That's, that's where I start. I, whatever you're envisioning, whatever you've mapped out, so long as it's not really stupid, right, uh, which happens, um, I want to see the thing built, and I want to see if it's going to actually work. Will this plane fly or not fly? Um, and I want to try and clear as many obstacles for people to allow them to do that in a safe and productive way as possible. And I think that most of the people that I talk to in the legal space, that's their sense of it too. How do we support innovators and allow them to make the things that are going to happen in the future without trying to prejudge what should be successful or not? 
That's a pretty good segue to you, Gary, because, I mean, you've been there wearing the other hat on the regulator side, and I think there are people here who would love to get your insights into how best to approach those regulators and how do we get them to, you know, arrive at what Patrick's describing, where we can innovate, but, of course, pay attention to this, this safety concern, the, you know, stability, financial, financial security, customer protection, all those sorts of things. What is the... What is the right way? Are, are, are people approaching us the right way? What can they do to, to sort of win, get, get to the, the best place? So I, I'm going to follow Patrick and break the rules and uh, start with a couple compliments. Um, I, I'm honored to be on this panel because I'm the newbie. I mean, I'm the old washed up regulator wearing a blazer in this audience, but uh, I'm the newbie to this space. And uh, to be with Patrick, who's been there so long, and uh, Coin Center that's really at the forefront in Washington, and Michael, who's now just gotten his second, <laughs> hopefully, best-selling book in the space. Um, uh, and I'm also honored to be at MIT, and I just want to say the reason I came to MIT answers a bit of your question, because when Joey Ito and Simon Johnson approached me in the fall to say, hey, what are you doing? Do you want to join MIT? I couldn't think of a better place to be, not only because MIT is a fabulous institution with really exciting and, and talented people, but the intersection of blockchain slash Bitcoin and digital currency initiatives and the economy is a very exciting place and it's at the forefront rather than looking backwards. You know, there are a lot of Washington looks backwards. What, what can we do to avoid that last crisis or that last hiccup? This is a very forward looking technology and a place that can move the economy forward today, foremost in finance, but also beyond finance, and that's what a lot of your book's about. In terms of the public policy space, because I broaden it from regulation to public policy, I come back to, to answer your question, it's about confidence. Uh, markets, capital markets in particular, work best embedded in confidence. And whether it's a centralized institution or a decentralized ledger, Millions of people, billions of people use things because of confidence. And so I would think about one of Patrick's colleagues at Harvard, Larry Lessing, who says, if you really want to affect an outcome, you have to think through four different avenues. There's architecture or technology. Well, that's the Bitcoin itself. There's law, which we're going to be debating here. There are markets. What are the incentives the, the, that promote the market? And there's just social norms. I don't think we can achieve the underlying goal is confidence. I'll come back to that in our Q&A. We can't achieve that unless we actually have all four, the technology, the kind of social norms, of course. Yes, the law, like we do need some speed bumps every once in a while in the road. Um, and, uh, and then the incentive structures, the economics. My thought right now is the Securities and Exchange Commission is the most recent because, as Jerry said, it was first AML and uh, illicit activity, then it was tax. Now we seem to be at the heart of the capital markets. When is an ICO a security? When does an exchange need to be regulated? I'm probably like others on this panel that want to promote innovation, but I think the best way to promote innovation is to accept, and for many of you who are thinking about doing coin offerings, to accept that what's come to date most, maybe not all, but most are actually under the U.S. securities laws. And most of the exchanges, not all, are a bit of a mess where they can't really assure that they won't lose a customer's Bitcoin or other tokens, or even worse, that they won't personally use it. So the don't use it, don't lose it, and some market integrity builds confidence. So that's what I've turning back to. Right, and it's, it's, it's all working to plan, because uh, I'm going to move over to, back to Jerry here again, because you've just actually presented to Congress on the issue of ICOs. And of course, it's the hot topic of the moment. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned in your opening remarks that, you know, the ship is shaking a little bit because there's all this attention around that. I mean, are we heading in the right direction? Are clearly something needs to happen. I mean, there's a great deal of concern around scams and just the sheer sort of speculative mania and, and that inevitably is getting people's attention. And I think a lot of us would agree with Gary that so many of these would be deemed to be securities. 
But my concern is that we can throw babies out with bathwater if we do this, and not only in terms of the actual regulation, but the entire narrative that gets associated with it. Like, how do we, and is the SEC on the right path in, in, in what they're doing right now to get us to a place where innovation is still able to flourish? Sure, so, you know, this last hearing is a good example of, of, of the positivity, right? So we, we've, we've seen, I think, about a half a dozen hearings in Congress since 2013 on cryptocurrency um, or something related. And Coin Center, somebody from Coin Center has testified at each one of those. And the first five, save for this last one, they have all been incredibly positive results where people are excited about technology. Even when we had one last year on um, the potential for terrorist use of cryptocurrency, that was a great hearing where it was aired, what was possible, what was not possible, what was being done was all aired. This last hearing on ICOs, um, I think was a bit of a draw, maybe a little bit negative. And the reason for that is a couple things. I think there's just a lot of um, confusion. Um, so for us, approaching that hearing and approaching the ICO question broadly, question number one, right, or, or job number one, is to make sure that regulators and folks in Congress especially um, understand that Bitcoin, and cryptocurrencies like it that are completely decentralized, do not have an issuer, um, are not securities, right? That they are better treated as a commodity. And I think the CFTC has found that to be the case. So separating that, those from everything else, is sort of job number one. And I think on that point, we've largely been successful. I, I think the CFTC definitely gets it. I think the SEC, you know, it, the SEC is, is not in the business of saying what things are not securities. Um, but I, I'm, you know, if I, if I had to guess, I would guess that commissioners and staff at the SEC understand something like Bitcoin is not a security. Um, Congress, it's a little bit. They, they do. I, yeah. I would say they understand Bitcoin's yeah. not a commodity, uh, not a security. Right. It gets a little trickier when you get to um, uh, yeah. Ether. I mean, you know, you sort of, all right, maybe that's not because it's so established, but then right. what do you do? File coin and you, you start yeah, to down the. Yeah. Down the Totally. Yeah. So um, Ether, I think there's a, there's a very um, good case to be made that it's not uh, a security. Um, and you can, you can you know, uh, you, of course, you have to look at each of them individually. Um, and so I think the CFTC, the SEC, they get it. Congress, I think, some of them get it. Others confuse the word security with investment. And so they think that because you can speculate on these things, that the securities laws should apply. And that that's, doesn't follow. Um, but again, that's a matter of education. As far as what the SEC and the, S and the CFTC have, have been doing and what's, what do we need to do here, um, I think the laws as they exist today um, can be applied with really no new additional um, uh, legislation or regulation for the most part. Um, and it would be, you know, it will work just fine. So something like Filecoin, right, where you are making a promise of future tokens, that's clearly a security, right? That promise of future tokens is clearly a security. Where there's a question is, in the future, once the network is, is launched, and it is completely decentralized, which is very important, nobody controls it, it is unowned, um, and the tokens are then delivered and can be used, um, what, is, what are those tokens then? And I think there's a gray area, but I think um, the, right thing, the right policy call here to do, to, to do is to say, yeah, it's not a security, it's a commodity, because um, if you've limited yourself earlier to accredited investors or you've done a public offering, um, you've accomplished the investor protection mission, and now when the tokens can actually be used on a decentralized network, it's, it's a commodity. Um, where I, so that's one gray area. Where I also think there's, a, there's a potentially a gap is with exchanges. So how are exchanges regulated today? They're regulated by state uh, money transmission licensing. It's a very inefficient system. You have to get a license in every state in which um, you have customers, which means every state. But, but Montana. But Montana, and I think Arizona too? It's Montana, okay. Um, and the issue with that is, one, it's very efficient, but number two, some of the concerns you hear out of Capitol Hill is there's no market supervision for these exchanges. The CFTC um, has sort of after the fact policing authority, if there's manipulation or fraud, insider trading, um, they can investigate and enforce. But there's no supervision where the, the SEC has over um, securities uh, exchanges. And so, to the extent that this trades differently than other commodities, maybe you'd want to see some market supervision, that's somewhere where you might want to say, hey, let's um, get rid of this inefficient state-by-state -state system and have some federal um, 
uh, licensing answer provision. And do you think the SEC was almost signaling that with both of you, perhaps, and Patrick as well? I mean, it seemed to me that that recent statement they made seemed to be wanting to go people that they want the, the, the yeah. exchanges to play this kind of self-regulatory role on behalf of the SEC. I think, I think it is without a doubt that the SEC was signaling uh, that numerous exchanges will have to seek exemptions under regulation ATS, alternative trading systems. These uh, have been regulated since 1998, um, but because many of the exchanges, not all, not all, but many of them also have tokens which are securities trading right. on them, I think they, they the SEC, uh, will fit it into that. But taking it to first principles, moving away from the tactical sort of uh, details, the first principles uh, and why the Securities and Exchange Commission was set up and why they were set up in other countries is to protect investors or consumers, some people call it, but investor protection and the integrity of markets. In, in essence, the pricing function, that it's free of manipulation, free of fraud, and that buyers and sellers meet with some transparency. And I think to those first principles, uh, securities regulators around the globe, I was uh, recently off in Asia with eight countries regulators, and we were debating these issues as well. It's whether those first principles get applied to the crypto space or they're not. I think in the US, we're seeing that they're leaning in with that announcement, that they wanna lean in and apply some of those first principles. I'd say in some other countries, no, they're really more around um, the illicit activity or, or uh, money transmission. In Japan, for instance, it's more about custodial first principles and money transmission. So can I, can I just say one thing quickly? Sure. It's, it's important to, and you, you did this, but I wanna just highlight it for, for the audience, to distinguish between you know, there are exchanges like Coinbase or Gemini that only trade about two, three, four tokens. Bitcoin, you know, Ethereum. And they limit themselves to those because they've made a judgment that these are not securities or commodities. So the SEC would not supervise them at all, have anything to do with them. There are other exchanges that trade a whole swath of tokens, many of which are very likely securities. And those, if you're trading securities, you need to be a national securities exchange or an ATS. Um, and so, you know, just wanted to, to sort of highlight that. Um, you know, it's gonna be interesting to see how the SEC a, a approaches this, this question. Patrick, I mean, just the thing that I think about a bit on this is that, to Jerry's point as well, we've, only, we've got this existing legal framework and that can be good. Uh, we can figure out ways we could imagine that, you know, a utility token, if, you know, by virtue of not falling within that security law is, is, is free to be used without you know, the, the registration and, and regulatory framework. But I worry that um, because this is such a unique, innovative field where we have um, you know, such a different way of conceiving of the world, that, that we're faced with this problem of taxonomy and we're faced with um, that, that, that maybe the SEC's kind of classic Damocles sword approach where it just says, you know, you know what the Howey test says, so here's the deal. If you're a security, don't do anything. Is there a need for more clarity? You talked about grey areas before, Jerry, and because I worry about innovators just saying, look, I'd love to do it, but I'm just scared shitless. What am I supposed to do? I mean, what, what is, can the SEC do, is there more signaling that needs to happen? Well, I think maybe one thing that's really missing, in the US anyways, is more interagency cooperation and coordination, right? Which is typically a role that's played by the White House, which, you know, leave it there. Um, so, uh, and, and they'll usually form a task force or something like that and bring heads of agencies or representatives from agencies together to sort these things out. So there are clear jurisdictional boundaries for different types of products and services and activities, right? Whenever you get into principles-based regulation, right, really activities-based regulation, you're inevitably going to have these gray areas, but that doesn't mean you want to over-specify. Right? The, if you go the other direction and you start over-specifying what things are and are not within these certain frameworks and the types of rules for those things, mm -hmm. you lose what's called the technolo technological neutrality of these regulations. Yeah. Right? And then what you find is you have regulators in the position of determining business models and picking winners and losers. Right. We don't want that. So it's a delicate balance, mm -hmm. right? but you want to be able to maintain kind of a principles-based, tech-neutral, proportional regulatory regime, and that last word's important, proportional, 
right, proportional to the actual risk. Regulatory regime, which for the most part we do a good job of here in the U.S., right? So we want to balance that while at the same time preserving these regulatory white spaces that allow people to go in and operate um, and innovate without major life-altering risk uh, to themselves for doing things that, you know, maybe just blurring the line a little bit or slightly over a certain boundary, right? Yep. Nobody wants to defend people who are out there scamming other people. Right. There's uh, uh, one more. Sure. Gary, Gary mentioned the two prongs that the SEC has, and there's a third one, right, which is promoting capital formation, right? And it stems from the first two. Gets to your point about creating confidence in markets, right? So the SEC can do that as a regulator, but we can do that, right? The SEC, we talk about community in the blockchain space. The SEC is part of our community, right? We're building social systems. They're part of that community too. And as a broad community, we can create confidence in those markets, whether it's through self-regulatory efforts, through better disclosure, policing out the scammers ourselves, we can create better confidence and promote capital formation and things like that and, and help agencies like the SEC rather than viewing them as like some distant enemy. I, I think it's yeah. that what Patrick said there answers your very fundamental first question. And if anybody remembers anything of a long day of this conference, it's, I think, Patrick's point right there, is that the, the public policy space, whether they're in, in, in legislative bodies around the globe or they're regulators around the globe, and I wouldn't, this is not just a U.S. set of issues. This is a global set of issues. Um, the public policy actors are part of the community. They're generalists. They have other jobs to do. They are not thinking about uh, snor uh, schnorr proofs <laughs> uh, that uh, Neha was You're talking about quickly, earlier. <laughs> And you don't want them to, by the way. Um, but they're part of the community. So I think uh, Patrick's point's the, the real one, is bringing them in mm. and helping, now to get uh, specific, helping the SEC help the community define, the, uh, in essence, the duck test. If it waddles like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. And that's kind of how a lot of public policy people are thinking about the initial coin space right now. If it doesn't waddle like a duck, it doesn't quack like a duck, <laughs> it's a Bitcoin, it's, it's not. You know, it's, right. it's, it's sort of that. Okay, I, I'm just not quite sure how much time I have and whether I should be opening up this to questions. Do we, how much, do you give me an idea how much more time I have? 15. Oh, good. I thought I had a little <laughs> bit less than that. Great. Well, in that case, um, maybe... Uh, just shift a little gears here. I mean, one of the things that I think is important from the, you know, this space and, and how regulation is perceived within it is the kind of, as we hear it a lot, borderless nature of the technology. Um, it can, it, you know, and we see it, right? It can roll up anywhere. Um, we have these distributed organizations that have developers anywhere. Um, and as a result, there is something of a competition already happening around jurisdictions in the world. We've got the Swiss, the Swiss model for the foundations and the ICOs. We've got Singapore doing, you know, some interesting things around sandboxes, London as well. China taking a kind of very kind of a back and forth position, it seems to me. And then the US trying to find space within its existing multifaceted regulatory model. I mean, how does this play out on an international stage and how important is it that the United States thinks about this regulatory arbitrage concept that they, you know, that, that they may lose out to? Yeah, you, uh, Gary, if you can pick it up, it'd be great. So I... I um, uh, Recently, was over in Japan, the JFSA, which is the Japanese lead securities regulator, and the Bank of Japan hosted a, a conference. Uh, so I just have a, a you know, a, a, a recent temporal uh, sense of this. I think, as Mark Carney said from the Bank of England, uh, there's a first principle sort of thing that all public policy folks are thinking. Do you isolate this space? Do you integrate it? Do you regulate it? And there's some countries that have just said, isolate it until later. And we, I mean, China isn't quite fully in isolation mode because some of the biggest miners are obviously in China and some of the exchanges still kind of operate in China. They're banning mining slowly. Yeah, but, but, but they're closer to the isolate side. So there's some big point there. I would say, that, uh, and watch the Financial Stability Board, watch the international organizations like the IOSCO in the security space and the Bank of International Settlement in the central bank space, and of course the um, uh, other spaces. The greatest 
consensus is probably in the place that got regulated first is the illicit activity space, uh, any money laundering and the like. That seems to have a high degree of consensus, though there's still gonna be some jurisdictions that wanna arbitrage and get activity. I think the least amount of consensus right now is in the market integrity, what is a security public policy debate, and there will be numerous countries that utility-like tokens will not be regulated as securities. And I think there will be a difference. I think the, our country will be leaning forward. My experience uh, in uh, my prior jobs is when the U.S. leans in, uh, Europe usually aligns, not entirely, uh, but certain Asian jurisdictions will probably uh, not be there. I mean, MAS from Singapore has already said no, utility tokens, uh, we're, 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 we're not gonna lean into that. And so there'll be some regulatory arbitrage uh, in this space as well. Exchanges will be the more interesting, I think, because uh, they're, they're multi-jurisdictional, or you might even say not jurisdictional at all. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly um, some of them. Uh, and so if the U.S. leans in, in some sense, um, beyond the anti-money laundering side, but towards the market integrity side, um, that will probably uh, fragment markets a bit for a while because there'll be some just offshore exchanges which will try their hardest not to take U.S. customers. But I'm not sure that's really practical. It's very hard to draw those lines, right? Um, I just want to pick up something Gary said, Jerry. You could, so he, he talked about um, consensus around you know, illicit uh, funds, money laundering, and so forth. I, I hope, because you're obviously not a big fan of the bit license, you would suggest that the bit license has become that consensus. What is, what, what's your uh, interpretation of, say, the FATF and, and how, they, how, how they've come to see the best way to handle the, the AML uh, question? Yeah, so um, I wouldn't say it's a bit license, right? The, right. the, the, uh, the model is going to be FinCEN's um, guidance in 2013. Yeah. And um, look, it's, it's, it's a reasonable approach, because what the approach says is, um, intermediaries in this space, and in particular exchanges, which are the on-ramps and the off-ramps to the cryptocurrency space, that's where the law attaches, that's where the regulations apply. And that's fair, right? They're, to the extent that you're gonna have requirements that uh, somebody hand over information about um, users, um, it makes sense that it is gonna be financial institutions like exchanges who have signed up customers, right, and can do know your customer. I would be singing a completely different tune if we, um, if FinCEN had come out and said that miners or that software wallet providers needed to collect information and provide it. Um, they have never said that, right? They've always focused on the intermediaries. And that has been sort of the consensus that everybody has. Until recently. Until very recently, which, which, which gets to the, sh the ship shaking, right, with the ICO boom. And so yeah. what we saw recently was kind of a bit of an anomaly, um, which is what you're referring to, which is that Senator Wyden asked FinCEN, what are you doing about um, anti-money laundering with cryptocurrency broadly, right, and, and ICOs. And FinCEN, um, it wasn't FinCEN, which is interesting. It was sort of the legislative liaison office at Treasury, which is interesting, right? So you gotta keep that in mind. They responded and saying, that, yeah, if you're issuing an ICO, um, you need to do um, uh, AMLKYC, which is odd, um, because if what you're doing is selling a token that you own, you're not an intermediary. You're, you're not standing between two parties. You own something, you built something, you built a network, there are tokens running on it, and you have taken this thing that you own and you sold it to somebody. That is a, not a transaction that typically would have Bank Secrecy Act um, implications. And look, you know, this is something that is quite a big policy shift, if it is indeed a policy shift. We're still trying to get some information about that. And it's the sort of thing where you can't have that kind of policy shift announced or created in a letter responding to a senator's query. This has to be done. Yeah, yes, you can. <laughs> yeah. What I would advocate for is that this, <laughs> under the Administrative Procedures Act, you absolutely have to put this up for notice and comment rulemaking for formal rulemaking. It's the ideal I, in this. I'm, this, I'm, this. I'm only kidding around, but yeah. having lived in Washington, yeah. Yeah. policy pronouncements, uh, yeah. There are many tools. It can be in a yes. speech, cabinet secretary speech. Yeah. It can be in a notice and comment rulemaking. And in this case, uh, I actually think, well, I can't speak for this administration. I, I, I kind of was from <laughs> another. Can't. But, but <laughs> normal procedures, Republican and Democrat alike, a major cabinet department's legislative affairs office sends a letter like that. It's cleared in yeah. the building, oh, sure. and it's, it's, actually, yeah. it's actually trying to express a policy 
point of view. It, oh, yeah. It, in normal times, I would say this is administration policy, and this uh, yeah. can't be sure. Patrick, do you want to just weigh in on them? We can just actually open, open up to the sure. floor for some questions. Well, I just, I wonder if it's a policy shift, is that a fair way to treat the community that you're a part of? Right? Uh, I'm it, not speaking for this administration. Know, right? But that's the question we should ask, and I think Jerry's point, right? Is it fair to shift gears? Is it legal? And, and is it legal, which is another question, right? Um, under the APA, which I agree there's a potential challenge there if this is what's happening. Is, um, is that a fair way to treat the other members of your community? If it's really, we're all part of the same community and trying to police these things, you know, bring in the expertise hear from people in the community. And, and I think, again, I think for the most part, we've seen that, right? And, and I don't want to prejudge this because it was just one letter. And they even cited a letter ruling in a footnote, like almost inappropriately. Like it was very, there's a lot of bizarre things in that letter, I, I would say. So I don't want to overstate this one letter. But it just comes back to that point of, right, we're all trying to do the same thing, most of us, right? Um, and we should coordinate and really get the, the best regulations, right, that inspire the most confidence in people, right? Okay, let's just take a couple of questions. But real politic, I agree, is different yeah, from, yeah, yeah. you know, right. that. Yes, up there. Um, is it on? Okay, good. Okay. Um, so this one's more for Patrick, but it's kind of around the concept of the way that the securities laws and people have been doing token sales. So it seems like the model today is that they're a lot of people are doing securities offerings through regulatory exemptions, and then there's this concept that even if it's a reg it's a security, at some event in the future, it converts into a utility. Do you believe, or does anyone on the panel believe that there's a con there is an event that could occur when something was sold as a security and it could suddenly not be a security in the future? Um, so I'll reserve a, some of my comments uh, on this particular topic and let Jerry uh, opine freely. <laughs> Um, there, I will say that there are a lot of different frameworks that are um, out there. We don't know which ones will work exactly. Um, some of them rely on selling a token, and then that token gets exchanged for another token. Some rely on pre-selling rights in a token, or a token that doesn't have any functional ability, and then it slowly gains functional ability. And others rely on selling a separate instrument, which is a security, that isn't the token itself, but there will be tokens in the future that come up. So it's not necessarily the same thing that converts. It's two separate tracks. If, you know, it's, it's still um, a gray area as to what the, and there are other models that are out there that are being proposed and, and we need more innovation, legal innovation. Uh, Jerry, just quickly, because we do have a bit of a lineup there. Yeah, yeah just I, I think when, when folks say that a security converts to a commodity, they don't really mean that. So right. um, no, securities don't convert to commodities. What you have typically, what, when somebody says it converts, what they're describing is the following. Um, I make a promise for future tokens in exchange for money. That is called a contract, right? It's called an investment contract. That is a security. That promise for future tokens is an, is a, is an investment contract and therefore a security. In the future, once I've built a completely decentralized network that I no longer have control over, I hand over tokens. Not, so the promise was a security. I hand over tokens. Those tokens at that point, I think if you um, did an analysis, you would find those tokens are not securities. They're commodities. Right. So it's not that something converted, it's that over here you had the promise of future tokens, a, it's a security, and then you have the tokens, a commodity. But it's still this concept of a transitional it, moment, it, though, it, right? It's still a gray area. It's, it's, no contract the excuse. it's this question of how we temporarily go from one moment yeah. where there could not have been tokens uh, to another where there are, right? So it, this is the key point. Let's take a question up, up there. Uh, first of all, thank you. This has been uh, fascinating. I just had a question. So we, I think we all know examples of tokens that are securities. Can you give me an example of a security right now that is trading that is a token? Uh, I don't know if it's still trading, but the Dow. The Dow. Right? <laughs> I mean, the SEC has written an investigative report that said it was, in fact, a security, right? No, I meant one that actually went through the process to become a security. I see. Oh, oh, Praetorian yeah. filed uh, last week. So uh, there's a, it hasn't been issued yet, but they filed under the securities laws. It's called Praetorian. Uh, filed on the securities law on March 9th. I think it's the first. So one out of, say, 10,000? Well, but out capital. of the other, I, I think it's more like 2,000. But out of the other 2,000, it's quite possible that a majority of them will be viewed by the SEC as securities. They just haven't filed as securities. Right. 
Let's just type one up here. Quick. It's kind of a macro level question based on the banking side of it. Um, we just went through a major financial crash, specifically on credit default swaps. And so if everything's verified and you can't really do credit default swaps like you did before, doesn't this ask the market to be destroyed kind of like we experienced in 2008, except two times harder? Are we really prepared to see that kind of implementation happen in the next 10 years? Uh, Gary, good one for you, Benji. I think one of the public policy spaces that we have yet to talk about, and I thank you for this question, is financial stability. Um, financial stability uh, is very much on the mind of the central banks, and, and as it should be. I think it is on the mind of the Securities and Exchange Commission, but it's not first order right now as they're thinking through these other uh, dynamics. Um, and whether, I think again, back to Patrick's point, this community can help Central banks in particular, and finance ministries around the globe, securities regulators thirdly, but, but the central banks and so forth first, s see their way clear that this is not uh, a challenge to financial stability, but, but the whole cryptocurrency space can enhance resiliency in the system rather than enhance fragility. And that's the debate. Does it make it more fragile or does it make it more resilient? I, I am one who thinks it can actually make the system more resilient, but I will tell you a lot of central bankers aren't quite sure of that. ZK Ledger is one word I would like to use in that context, right? I mean, it's exactly the concept we're trying to say here is that we do have the technological tools that could in fact, potentially enhance this. And I think it's an, a key part of the conversation that Jerry's been involved with for some time is trying to educate these regulators and to say that as much as you have your regulatory obligations to them, start thinking about them as, as tools, in fact, right? Um, let me just throw up another question up here. Yep. Just wanted Jerry? to thank you, hey. first of all, for a great Hello, panel. Uh, <laughs> I'm building some wallet software. Uh, and so when I talk to people about what you need in a wallet, the thing everybody is looking for is they need some sort of qualified custodian. And this is because there are rules that say a fund can't self-custody more than $150 million of assets. As far as I understand, among the kind of like bumper crop of uh, crypto funds coming up, a lot of them are self-custodying more than $150 million of assets. So what I wanted to ask is, given that context, uh, what's going to happen to them? Is there going to be, do you think, an enforcement measure saying that they have to you know, splinter off? Um, or do you think that it's going to be kind of forgiven because there is, as far as I understand, no standard operating procedure here and forcing that regulation would uh, be you know, an onerous uh, burden on the space? Jaren? <laughs> um, I think Bitco is going to have a lot of customers uh, lining up. Um, so no, I, I, look, I, I think um, there's going to be a race, I'm sure you're part of it, to build those businesses that can fulfill uh, that need. You know, I, I tend to give the benefit of the doubt um, to the folks at the SEC who so far have been incredibly thoughtful, and I think it's kind of hard to um, require somebody to um, do something that's impossible. Um, that's how you should, maybe you shouldn't be doing the thing at all. Um, uh, but, you know, we're starting to see different um, alternatives come online, and I, and I think it's going to be resolved that way. I, I doubt that there's going to be some, um, um, like, big enforcement action, on, uh, you know, unless there's some activity that I'm unaware of that, you know, is especially dangerous. Enforcement action. Oh, no, please go. Ahead. Enforcement actions often come when uh, uh, there's been some public harm. Yeah. So in Japan, coin check loses a half a billion U.S. dollars worth of NEM, then you see enforcement action. So sometimes it's in reactions. Right. Yeah. yeah, and think about it as you're operating, and the registered custodian problem is a real one, especially for the funds, right? Um, and, and especially if you have a fund and you only, you know, put $50 million to work, but, I mean, in the market over the last year, you easily would have eclipsed $150 million, basically just throwing darts, right? Which may say something about the market, but that's... <laughs> um, the... The question you ask yourself, right, is what is that rule meant to do? Like, what right. was the policy goal for implementing that rule? And if you can't fulfill the rule, can you at least fulfill what the spirit of that rule was, right? That it's really risky to put all of those funds under the custody of a single person who could misappropriate them, lose them. Um, if you're creating new risks, like cyber risks that didn't exist before, things like that. So are there existing solutions, whether it's, you know, one of the multi-sig companies that are out there, or hardware signing servers distributed around the world to different parties, things like that that you can employ. 
to meet the goal of it. Okay, I'm sorry guys, we, we have to call it quits here. The tightly run ship of the Bitcoin club is pulling me off the stage. <laughs> uh, but thanks very much for your questions and your attention. Please, a round of applause for this panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>